Okay, so before I begin, how many folks here have kids? Okay, most of you. If not kids, you might have had a sibling or whatnot. I've got two kids, five and seven. I've got them squeezed into one bedroom sharing it. So how do we survive this is we have a lot of rules for how they work together, and we teach them a lot about sharing. The analogy here is what a lot of Jason talked about is squeezing our development infrastructure into smaller spaces. And so in order to do that, we need to look at the rules, and we need to think about how to share those spaces. And I think Jason provided a lot of great examples there, and we're going to go into a lot more detail here in this next section about how do we play in that smaller, compressed world and meet all those infrastructure and community needs while still having a low-impact design. Planners like to put a lot of rules out there, and they reflect a lot of our community values in terms of how we want to develop uh, sites to make sure there's mobility throughout the site for roadway standards, make sure that the homes aren't built too close together in some cases because people like to have that space. But when we're doing a low-impact development design, we need to look at those rules again and look at if they're compatible with what that design goal is and if there needs to be some negotiation on what those are. And this slide really kind of outlines a lot of those places in the code you may be looking for for restrictions or opportunities to do low-impact development. Looking at the comprehensive plan, the goals and policies, again, trying to get into that community values. The zoning code has a lot of different subsections within it that affect low-impact development design. So the landscaping code, native vegetation, tree protection, and open space requirements are all critical elements. Pervious surface standards may exist depending on the zoning you're developing within. And you need bulk and dimensional standards. Site plan review also develops quite a bit more uh, restrictions and opportunities for the, the projects. Parking is a very key aspect of doing low impact development design. How much space do you allow for parking? Where do you allow that parking? And how does it integrate it with the um, space? And then, of course, there's development code and standards, which has clearing and grading standards, the engineering and street standards, and again, the stormwater manuals all have rules that we need to follow in order to fit a low impact development design into them. A lot of what we're talking about there, preserving open space, compressing and clustering the developments. What we're talking about there is we're really going to probably go to a little bit smaller lots. And how do you accomplish that while doing low impact development design? Well, a lot of times you're going to need a lot more flexibility in the code. You're going to squeeze these parcels closer together so that you can still build large and large enough buildings to, to be marketable as well as trying to build as many lots as you can. If you're doing a developer, the number of lots and how you sell them is going to be affecting your bottom line. So how can you get a little bit more lots out of there? You may get a little bit less resale value for a smaller lot, but maybe you can get a couple extra lots because you're not taking away space or potential lots to put a downstream stormwater facility. But again, you may need flexibility in that code. And some of that flexibility may be inside and front yard setbacks and ways to mitigate those um, setbacks. So if you're doing a narrow or side, side setback, consider fireproof siding so that there's less concerns about the fire department being able to access that. And another thing that's really key to that, and again, making sure that you can A, make use of that open space through like the full dispersion requirements, but also for resale value, if you're going to compress these and have smaller sites, and people want to have more access to those open spaces. So be very flexible and strategic about how you integrate the lots with that open space. I mean, Curtis's example had a lot of very small lots, but many of those lots, the back end of those lots were fronting open space. So that can kind of mitigate that kind of narrow, smaller, compressed site because people now will start valuing that open space that's next to the lot, and actually that can increase the resale value of those homes. This is a really unique site design. It's very compressed. In the upper right there, you can see kind of a rendering of the landscape there. A lot of small lots that are all fronting kind of a community green, and that's what this photo is here with a community kind of house within it. And what's unique about that is within this, this community green, that's where the stormwater, centralized stormwater facility is. It's in a vault underneath there. But in order to do this, the site plan gets a little condensed. What they're doing here on this site plan is between each of those homes, that shaded area, those are rain gardens. So each home, the roof downspouts go into these rain gardens. It's a very tight soil site, so they do have underdrains, and all those underdrains then connect to that central facility. Within that space, you got to have the services to each home. So you got to have the gas line, the sewer, power, all of that be integrated within that site design. So again, you're, you're really thinking about how those utilities interact and how do you get them together. What's kind of cool, though, about that site, then, is that that central stormwater facility, it's drier during most of the year, so it's multiple uses. During the summer times, it's a community space, and during the winter times, then, it's a stormwater facility, but because you're infiltrating it between and within those homes, then it's more available. Those smaller storms don't make that centralized space less available for community open space and use. People is talking about the right-of-way, and I like to think of each section as an opportunity to share spaces. So, you know, what we're trying to do, again, is we're trying to eliminate total impervious area, that's the TIA, and eliminate effective impervious area, that's the EIA here, of wherever possible. So wherever we have a hardscape surface, which is what's necessary for roads to run on and for pedestrians to move safely about, 
try to not directly put that into a catch basin. Find a way to get that in connected to the landscape. So disconnect it and effectively make it less impervious. And that also increases infiltration. So again, any space within that roadway scape can become a stormwater BMP if you're thinking about the impacts. If you're mitigating and addressing those impacts to make sure that you're not flooding adjacent basements or going into utilities. But again, this is the idea where you can do combined uses. So if you think about the very central to travel way of the roadway, that still can do multiple uses. If you have slow traffic, you can have a narrow roadway to where each direction is sharing that space. It's a queuing kind of design if it's a very local access street. Or it can be shared as a stormwater practice if you do porous pavement. So it could be both for the traveling public and for the pavement area. That parking zone and that buffer zone between the tree, that's a great opportunity that Jason talked about, which is where you can integrate at certain spots within the block. It can be a rain garden, but then it can also be a parking space. Evaluate those needs and find out if that zone of that cross section can be shared between those needs. And the same thing with the sidewalk zone. Can that be porous and serve both the pedestrian scape, but also do your stormwater management underneath that area? A very big key is utilities in the roadway. Oftentimes that's one of the biggest challenges in the retrofit project and even with a new development project is where do you place those utilities and all the utility services in connection with where the stormwater facilities are going to go. So there's some guidelines in there, placing the water and sewer lines on the roadway in the middle of those areas so you don't have to cross them and you're not infiltrating on or near that water line that's potable. Clustering those water meters to minimize construction disturbance. Instead of having a water meter at every single lot that breaks up where you're going to be putting in rain gardens, have them clustered closer to the parcel line so that you have more open space to put in rain gardens. Another thing is if you have multiple water lines, because many times we're upgrading the public right away to have more fire flow protection, try to keep those water mains closer together so that the setbacks for potable water where you cannot infiltrate are not just eating up all of the right of way space. Another clever idea is taking all those dry utilities, all the telecommunications lines and power lines, and putting them in joint trenches. Get them in conduits so that they're not spread out throughout the right of way, and that leaves more space for the buyer retention or the porous payments or whatnot. Another key is just how do we deal with the, the interface of the bioretention and those utilities. It, oftentimes it's very difficult to avoid having like a roadside rain garden next to a utility service line. So how do we design for that so that you're not having an impact on adjacent properties? So oftentimes what you're going to need to really consider is lining those bioretention facilities at the utility interface. So either putting in an impermeable um, like till liner or even a geotextile fabric right where that utility is crossing. Um, in other cases, you may just do a trench dam plug in that utility trench so that any water that's infiltrating with the facility doesn't find that shortcut route through the utility trench. And again, there's a lot more detail we'll be doing in the advanced classes on how we design those details within it. But give consideration to where you can do that. The other thing within a streetscape is that oftentimes you'll need to have a connection of pedestrian connections between the parking spaces and the sidewalk. That's a great spot for uses to come in because again, in between those pedestrian connections is where you're going to put in a rain garden. So again, laying all that out thoughtfully in terms of where those services are going to be are going to help both with the initial layout as well as if there's any upgrades to that utility system, it keeps them from digging up those bioretention cells and increasing the cost of doing that work in the future. But another key is just really when you're doing a retrofit project, when you're working in the built environment, is you're going to have to have a lot of potholing because you're spreading out, you're doing work and doing underground work throughout the block. And so understand where the utilities are, do some potholing, and make sure the contractors really understand locations of those utilities need to be confirmed during construction, early on in construction, and adjusted during the project. So another key consideration is the circulation, meeting multiple use needs within that infrastructure. Integration of pedestrians with the stormwater wherever possible. But all the way around this development, you see these kind of brown pathways. Those pathways are kind of low areas that during the winter are serving as their stormwater features, stormwater conveyance. But during the summer, they're drier and they're being used as pedestrian spaces and giving people the chance to kind of experience nature throughout that area. It's a great idea of combined space with the open space and the conveyance network and pedestrian space and how you can get that multiple values without eating up more and more of that parcel area. Fire and safety, Curtis has already talked about that. Again, working with the fire departments to understand if the restrictions can be changed a little bit be based on how you design the site to allow for flow through there. Creating open space areas, using them as a community amenity now. Now that we've done low impact development, oftentimes we'll find that low impact development doesn't always rid you of all stormwater requirements. Oftentimes you may still need a larger flow control pond downstream because you still got to capture those large events and LIDs normally capturing those smaller events, but you can significantly, I do a lot of modeling this, 
and a lot of you know post construction monitoring, and you can find that you can often re very easily reduce the size of a stormwater pond by 30, 50, 60 percent just by doing the lightest, lowest touch, low impact development practices within the site. The other really cool benefit of that is then again, those small storm events are infiltrated at the site and don't fill up that downstream pond. So that pond can be much more gently graded, it can be much more of an amenity during those summer events rather than always being full, full of water. And you don't have to build this big fence around it and create it like a stormwater prison. Now it can become part of that, that site and part of the sales of, of what that whole development can be by being more of an amenity and again, having that multiple use within it using low impact development practices as traffic calming devices. Doing curb bulbs narrows that visual presence within the roadway. There's a lot of great studies that just show that, you know, a wide open roadway lets people just put on the gas pedal. But if you create more visual complexity and narrow that plane of vision, people slow down and they start looking around a little bit more for pedestrians and that could be a great traffic calming device. And again, if you can integrate those bump outs as rain gardens and chicanes or in curb bulbs, then you can accomplish that multiple benefits. We talked about in that earlier example of integrating low impact development into the landscaping so that it's also serving that visual buffering. So people have that sense of space and have their sense of privacy on their own lots, but you can still integrate trees with bioretention facilities and still create that visual buffer while still managing the stormwater on site. I'm actually going to talk about a couple of different projects we've worked on that kind of illustrate the principles of kind of site design, feasibility, and layout. You know, in my University of Washington class, what we do is we actually have a design project we have the class work on throughout the quarter. And I often ask very early on in the project, what is your proposal? What do you want to do for this project? And a lot of times the class, you know, almost every time it seems like, you know, basically say, I'm going to build a rain garden for my project at this site. So what's kind of wrong with that statement? It may not be the best thing for that site. Puts the cart before the horse. I mean, you don't know if that site is even feasible for low impact development yet. And you don't know if a rain garden is the best practice for that site. And so oftentimes I'll ask them to kind of back up a little bit and say what are kind of the broader goals. And maybe you're going to look at that as a possibility, but you need to go through all the steps to make sure that it's the appropriate practice. And this is a little bit of a confession one here. I had a project that kind of started off a little bit like that. And it's actually just down the road here. This is down in Belfair. This is a water reclamation facility that was built up on the hills up above uh, Belfair. And a little bit late in the project, I was asked to come in and say, let's, let's build some rain gardens for this project. Let's do it. It's outside of the urban growth area, so low impact development wasn't required, but it was a goal of that project. And I was like, great, let's go. Uh, let's talk to Geotech. Let's figure out what our exploration plan is, figure out where I can build these rain gardens. Well, we've already done the Geotech for the project. Okay. So let me take a look at that data. Our thing is, okay, well, let me look with the landscape architects out there as well. We really don't have budget for that. So starting off on the wrong foot a little bit, but we were still were able to kind of work through a good design that made it fit within that site. But what I found when I started going through the soil logs is certainly as most hillsides that are flat in the Puget Sound area, it was a glacial till site. But it had about three or four feet of weathered till in some of those initial borings. So I quickly worked with the team to kind of revise the grading plan so that we were actually doing more of a fill. The reclamation facility is up there in the northwest corner of the site. The rest of that is a large storage pond because what we were doing with the reclaimed water was land applying it to, to get rid of the water because we couldn't discharge the Hood Canal. So actually most of the site was eaten up by that reservoir. And in fact, in many cases, we actually had to do a liner because that reservoir actually exposed some good infiltrating soils, but we did not want to infiltrate. So it's like, you know, that gets back to that story of early on, had we been able to do a geotech, could we have reconfigured that site to be able to do the facility where we could infiltrate and do the reservoir where we couldn't infiltrate, where we were in glacial till. But nonetheless, what we d ended up doing was changing the grading to actually have some of that fill and some of that uh, grading work to where the reclamation facility, the facility where we're doing the treatment is actually up high. So that when we build those rain gardens, the bottom of those rain gardens are still infiltrating within that weathered zone. In addition, because we had uncertainty about exactly where that till layer was within the site, we added under drains for all of those rain gardens and put caps on them. When we did the construction, we could actually retrofit and use those, activate those under drains if we exposed till. And in a couple of these sites, we did actually end up hitting till. They didn't initially drain. We pulled the plug off those under drains, and now they're working and functioning very well. So in the end, you know, we ended up having a pretty successful ribbon cutting. We won some sustainability awards, and it was because we were able to kind of work through that design. But it may have been a little bit better <laughs> in hindsight had we been able to get involved in that a lot earlier, because we might not have needed all those under drains in order to construct that facility. So another example, this is actually going all the way across the country. This is in Syracuse, New York. Um, this is actually a combined sewer uh, jurisdiction in Syracuse, New York, where the county is partnering with the city. And they also have some nonprofit partners that help them divine 
green infrastructure projects. And they've built hundreds over the last couple of years of green infrastructure projects. And kind of the lesson here is a little bit how you have to adjust your initial vision of the project. This is a rendering that was done by this nonprofit to identify the project. And they had all these green infrastructure BMPs throughout the project. They had porous pavements in the parking lanes. They had cross by retention cells within the, the rain garden space. They had porous sidewalk. They had a lot of green infrastructure, which is great. It's a beautiful vision. But as the project continued, we found a few limitations to doing all of that vision. For one thing, they wanted to do a bike boulevard. So there's a lot more needs in the space within it. They did want to achieve traffic calming, but there was a lot of storefronts that wanted to maintain good, solid access to their storefronts, as well as having vegetation, but having vegetation strategically placed so it wasn't creating a barrier between parking and the sidewalk. And then they also still needed deliveries. So a lot of the initial vision of these big fingers that come in and choke out the areas had to be redesigned in order to be able to allow the traffic to go through there. The other things that were kind of unique is it's Syracuse, New York. It, it snows quite a bit, so snowplow considerations had to be taken into it. So all of that information actually had to be done before you really developed the full vision for the project, before you really define the practices. So this is kind of a before and after pictures. So before, just kind of an old urban landscape that was paved everywhere. And in the end, what we ended up building was we did end up doing some porous pavements in the parking strips, but in many cases we just did pavers there because we had utilities in those locations. But instead of also depressing all of the landscaping strips and doing bioretention in those areas, we did what was called kind of an enhanced tree trench in those areas where we actually collected the runoff and put them into a perf pipe system that distributed to silver cells. And then the other thing was we didn't do porous pavement in the sidewalks because we're so close to the building frontages, we didn't want to have to waterproof all of those buildings. In doing all the modeling and looking at the soils, those tree trenches were able to do all of the infiltration that was the goal for the project. So again, it's, it's a matter of doing that homework ahead of time and understanding that before you define all the practices, you can actually optimize so that you can meet all of the needs within the right of way. So another before and after pictures. So this next example is one done in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and it was the idea of retrofitting a park to do bioretention. Early on, we looked at old aerial photos to see what the site looked like before the park was ever put in place, and it was an old drainage area. So the design was basically to build a bunch of rain gardens and porous areas that all interconnected to carry, capture that, that kind of watershed runoff and integrate it within the park design. So it worked very closely with the parks department to integrate bioretention cells around some of the play areas. And what they actually did, which was kind of cool, is did porous pavement underneath as this new surface for the basketball court. Something they've actually been doing quite a bit in that area is retrofitting older basketball courts with porous pavement. It actually creates, it does create a rougher surface, so depending on the acti high level of activity, can be a bit of a negative, but it also deadens the sound. So if it's around a denser community, sometimes the community actually has a positive feedback on that because it's a quieter play space. The other place I want to take a closer look at just a little bit is integrating what happens at the intersection there. This was a dangerous intersection with a high history of accidents between pedestrians getting to the park and between people moving through there. In this case, they actually bulbed out the curb extensions and did bioretention within those zones. Kind of looking at that kind of multiple use, it's serving now a stormwater function, but it's also improving traffic and traffic safety in that neighborhood. And then another consideration was they actually found that they had a lot of sediment load in that area. So looking at, they actually integrated some pre-settling cells there. Before and after pictures of the project created a much more narrow space, an area that slowed people down as they came closer to that park interface. So I want to zoom out again a little bit. So a lot of those examples were how to find the best practice given the site that you're working at. But oftentimes we also may be looking at where is the best place to do low impact development practices. So these are just a couple of examples of work that people can do to kind of package up the feasibility of low impact development before you even do an individual project. The city of Philadelphia is the graphic on the left. They mapped the entire city based on existing soils data and kind of did kind of a stop line analysis of where infiltration is most feasible. Darker green areas are where you have highest infiltration of soils and less restrictions based upon existing GIS data and soils reports. And the areas that are, that are shown in red there are areas where there's a hazard or there's a restrictive layer that would prevent infiltration from occurring. And that's very helpful for someone who's developing a project saying, okay, I think on this project the LID may be a feasible option. It also helps the reviewers understand the feasibility of that proposal. So it's again, kind of a streamlined approach to be able to help kind of grease the wheels of doing low impact development and make sure that it's being built in the right places, but not being built in places where there's gonna be hazards. And the one on the right is a similar analysis that was done for Burien. Defining where you want to do practices, this is a manual we did for Seattle Public Utilities for doing their options analysis for where to do green infrastructure retrofits. And the idea here is really that you start off with a big basin area where you might want to do practices, and you want to narrow that down to the best sites. 
And this can be applied both just at the site scale as well as at you know, kind of a neighborhood or watershed scale. The idea here is that you have these different bands of activities that may eliminate sites from being feasible. The lighter colored one is sites where you want it, it's just site constraints. There's just no room to do low impact development in those areas. And that's really the easiest thing to do because it's easy to go around and drive through the watershed and do a windshield analysis or look at Google Earth and determine this is a really dense space, we can't do it. The other two are a little bit more time intensive and more um, intensive in terms of what you're gonna put into it. Um, the lighter gray, the middle gray there is geotechnical explorations. Costs a lot of money to punch holes in the ground. So you wanna kind of narrow those sites down early on. But you still may have to do a geotechnical exploration to determine where it's feasible to do practices. And then the darkest gray is working with the community. The community may not want low impact development, or maybe they may we really want low impact development because they want traffic calming, they want renewal of the streetscape. So again, it's the kind of idea that as you move through that process, kind of horizontally, the design process in this graphic, you're gonna narrow down that band of where you wanna do the practices. And so, you know, in order to do that, you can do real quick uh, checklists to, to evaluate the site constraints, look at utilities, look at existing trees, look at a lot of those constraints within an existing built environment that may prevent you from doing low impact development. And oftentimes you're looking at those existing planter areas to find ways to, can we invert the roadway section instead of having a raised planter, can we do a bioretention cell?